Okay, we are about to continue. Indicate if you can hear me. Okay. All right, we still we're still on the trauma module. We're, we'll be focusing on chapter 28, which is head and spinal injuries. All right, the, so introduction. The nervous system is a complex network of nerve cells that enables all parts of the body to, func to function. It includes the brain, the spinal cord, and several billion nerve, fi nerve fibers. The nervous system is well protected. The brain is protected by the skull, and the spinal cord is protected by the spinal canal. Despite this protection, serious injuries can damage the nervous system. So, reviewing the anatomy and physiology, the nervous system is divided into two anatomic parts. You have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system consists of the spinal nerves and your cranial nerves. The peripheral nervous system further divides into the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system is responsible for voluntary movement, however, you can get what is referred to as a reflex response. So the impulse travels via the sensory nerve to connective nerves within the spine, and then motor nerves send a, a response to the fingertips. That's what would be considered a spinal reflex. So in other words, if a patient, let's say I pick up something that is very hot. So I pick up a ball or something that is very hot. My brain is not going to be considering, hey, that object that you pick up is, is very hot. You're going to burn up your fingertips. It's going to hurt. You need to release it. The brain is not going to initiate a response for that. What is going to happen is when I pick up, pick up that object that is hot, the sensory nerves in my fingertips will pick up the heat sensation and a signal will be sent via the sensory nerves to the spinal cord via connective nerves and then it crosses over to motor nerves which send a response to a response to the fingertips to release it so the signal does not reach the brain that is what we call a spinal reflex action or spinal reflex arc. So the central nervous system includes the brain and the spinal cord. The brain controls the body and is the center of consciousness. It is divided into the cerebrum, cerebellum, and the brainstem. The Cerebrum controls a wide variety of activities, including most voluntary motor function and conscious thought. Contains about 75% of the brain's total volume and divides into two hemispheres. With and the right hemisphere control movement on the left side of the body, left hemisphere control movement on the right side of the body. The cerebellum, the, the B and L in cerebellum, we use that to remember balance and coordinated movement. That's what the cerebellum is responsible for. It is sometimes referred to as the midbrain. Then you have the brainstem, which controls most functions necessary for life, best protected part of the CNS. So it's the most well protected area of the central nervous system. 
The spinal cord is the connection between the brain and the rest of the body. Now the brain has a membrane and the membrane has three layers, all right? Just remember DAP, remember that abbreviation, that um, those three letters, DAP, in that order, DAP. So you have the dura mater, the arachnoid layer, I have the pia mater. So the dura is the, the tough portion of the membrane. The arachnoid layer is the middle layer where you'll have most of the blood vessels. And then you have the pia mater, which is a soft layer. That's the area that directly attaches to the brain tissue. So there are three layers to the membrane that surrounds the, the brain, which is referred to as the meninges. All right, so the spinal cord, made up of fibers that extend from the brain, brain's nerve cells, carry messages between the brain and the body via the gray and white matter of the spinal cord. <clears throat> protective coverings. The entire CNS is contained within a protective framework. The thick bony structures of the skull and the spinal can canal withstand injury very well. The CNS is further protected by the meninges and have three layers, DAP, dura, arachnoid, and pia. Meninges, the outer layer, tough layer is the dura mater. It is a tough fibrous layer that forms a sac to contain the CNS. The inner two layers are the arachnoid, which is the middle layer, and the pia mater, which contains blood vessels. So on this diagram, you can see where the, the dura mater is. It's right under the, the skull framework, right under this layer. All right, then you have the ar arachnoid layer where you're gonna have your blood vessels. And then you have the soft portion, which is referred to as the, the pia mater. <clears throat> now, within the skull, we have cerebrospinal fluid. So it is produced in a chain inside the brain called the third ventricle approximately 125 to 150 mils of CSF is found in the, within that, that space within the skull at any given time. And it acts as a shock absorber. Primarily acts as a shock absorber, sorry. <clears throat> You have 31 pairs of spinal nerves, which conduct impulses from the skin and other organs of the spinal cord. They conduct motor impulses from the spinal cord to the muscles. The spinal nerves serving the extremities are arranged in complex networks. I have a portion that control movement in the upper extremities and a portion that control movement in the lower extremities. So you have the brachial plexus and you have the lumbar sacral plexus. Yeah, 12 pairs of cranial nerves transmit information directly to and from the brain, perform special function in the head and face. And we have moved from the central nervous system to peripheral. Perf once we're talking about spinal nerves and cranial nerves, that's peripheral nervous system. So 12 pairs of cranial nerves transmit information directly to or from the brain, perform special functions in the head and face include sight, smell, taste, hearing, and facial expressions. Two types of peripheral nerves, you need to be familiar with is your sensory nerves and your motor nerves. Sensory nerves carry only one type of information from the body to the brain. So sensory nerve carry information from the body to the brain. 
motor nerves carry information from the brain to the muscle. And then you have connective nerves which join your sensory and motory nerves together. So it's a link between the sensory and motor nerves, that's connective nerves. So connective nerves found only in the brain and spinal cord connects the sensory and motor nerves with short fibers, allow the exchange of simple messages. And these are messages that will not go directly to the brain. How the nervous system work? It controls virtually all the body's activities, which include reflex activities, voluntary activities, and involuntary activities. Connecting nerves in the spinal cord form a reflex arc. I've already explained what that is. If a sensory nerve in this arc detects an irritating stimulus, it bypasses the brain and sends the message directly to the motor nerve. And there is a picture depicting that, right? Sensory nerves pick up the heat, it goes to the connective nerves, jump over to the motor nerves, and then a response is initiated without going directly to the brain. Voluntary activities are activities we consciously perform. We must think about these activities. Involuntary activities are the actions that are not under conscious control. We don't have to think about that. Somatic, the somatic system is responsible for voluntary uh, movement, right? That would be somatic. So that's a, a branch of the peripheral nervous system. Of the autonomic, which is involuntary nervous system, functions that brain control. So it's divided into two sections, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system. The sympathetic nervous system reacts to stress with a fight or flight response. And the parasympathetic nervous system has the opposite effect on the body. All of this is information that you should be familiar with at this stage. My signal went down. Are you still able to hear me clearly? It's back up now. All right. Okay. The skull. So let's look at the skeletal component now. The skeletal system. The skull composed of two groups of bones. You have the cranium, thick shell above the eyes and ears that protects the brain and the facial bones. You have your, your cranium, you have the nasal bone, zygoma, which is the cheek, maxillae, or maxilla, I should say, which is the upper jaw, mandible, lower jaw. So the skull, the cranium is composed of 80% of brain tissue, 10% blood supply. 10% CSF. Now, with all of that space being occupied by brain tissue, it means that there's not a lot of space inside of the skull for swelling to occur. So swelling inside of the skull or bleeding inside of the skull is not gonna be a good thing. Four major bones make up the cranium, the occiput, temples, parietal regions, and frontal region. And the face is composed of teen bones, maxillae, zygomas, mandible, and the orbit. The spinal column is the body's central supporting structure. It consists of 33 vertebrae, that are divided in five sections, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, coccygeal. And each section has a set amount of 
vertebrae. So cervical, you have seven, thoracic 12, lumbar five, sacrum five, but they are fused, coccyx, four coccygeal, fused. Now, spinal column. Injury to the vertebrae can result in paralysis. So if there is injury at an area within the spinal column, within the spinal column, and it cuts off the, the impulses, then the patient can have paralysis below the level of the injury. <clears throat> Vertebrae are connected by ligaments and separated by cushions called intervertebral discs. Spinal column is almost entirely surrounded by muscles. And that's the, the axial review. Now let's look at, now that we have looked at the anatomy and the physiology, or I should say review the anatomy and physiology, because none, none of this is anything new. We covered this in anatomy and physiology. So that foundation should be there by now. Now that we have reviewed the anatomy and physiology, we're going into the injuries now. So let's look at the injuries. And we're starting off with head injuries. So trauma, traumatic insult to the head that may result in injury to soft tissue, bony structures, or the brain. 52,000 deaths occur annually in the United States as a result of severe head injury. Accounts account for more than half of all traumatic deaths. And this is really the worst patient you can get as a trauma patient, right? The worst patient you can possibly encounter in the field as a trauma patient is going to be a patient with head and spine injuries that is not able to maintain their airway or in cardiac arrest. You have closed injuries and you have open injuries. Closed, the brain has been injured, but there is no opening into the brain. Open injuries and opening from the brain caused by penetrating trauma, maybe bleeding and exposed brain tissue. And if you can see exposed brain tissue, do not try and put it back inside of the skull. Do not create any pressure on that area. Now, motor vehicle crashes are going to be the most common mechanism of injury for head injuries. That's the most common cause of head injuries. So head injuries are common, commonly associated with motor vehicle crashes. It can be an assault victim, and I'll have some videos to show. A matter of fact, I don't even need to show you a video. There was an incident involving a 17-year-old 17, 17 girl in which she was beat, beaten to the point of death, right? She was beat, beat into a coma. And that happened in Jamaica just this week, last week, I should say, right? So she was literally beaten to the point of entering a coma, right? Where the brain perfusion was, was um, compromised. But I think I saw an update that said she, she has woken up. I need to double check and find out what's going on there. So it can be associated with assault can be associated with your elderly population, right? And it's gonna be one of the common mechanism for the elderly population is going to be a fall. And they are going to be at risk for bleeding inside of the, the, the skull. I didn't see that question, let me go back and read that. Oh, so you're asking for the open injury. What is the correct thing to do? 
when we focus on management, I will explain there. And there's really not much for you to do for that patient. But I'll address that when we're looking at management. All right, so head injuries can occur during sport-related incidents, contact sports, um, boxing, mixed martial arts, uh, karate tournaments for black belts where you're allowed to hit to the, the head can have um, head injuries occur. Really bad head injuries are associated with boxing. In a variety of incidents involving children, right? Um, especially your younger population, pediatric population that are top heavy and don't learn to walk properly yet, they fall, they're not gonna try and break their fall. They're gonna drop on their head. So look out for, for head injury in that age group. Any head injury has the potential to become significant. Now, this table lists the signs and symptoms associated with head injury. Pay attention to it in your reading material. Now, scalp lacerations can be minor or serious. The scalp is very vascular, so a small cut can cause a lot of blood loss. Right? Now, even a small laceration can lead to significant blood loss, maybe severe enough to cause hypovolemic shock. They are often an indicator of deeper, more serious injuries. Now, let's look at skull fractures. Skull fracture. Significant force applied to the head may cause a skull fracture. It takes significant force to crack a skull. May be open or closed depending on whether there is an overlying laceration of the scalp. Injuries from bullets or other penetrating weapons often result in skull fractures. Signs of skull fractures include you're gonna see some sign of deformity in the, the skull. You might see a visible crack. You might see ecchymosis. Now, what is the difference between ecchymosis and a hematoma? Anybody have an answer for that question? The difference between ecchymosis and a hematoma. This is soft tissue injuries. I sent the recorded lecture for that. Did anybody review it? And have a response? Yes, Mr. Chantilou. Sir, I would say the ecchymosis is a minor skin injury. A minor skin injury. Mm. So what is a hematoma? I'm not quite sure about that one. Go ahead, Mr. Paul. The hematoma is blood pulling in the air. Or bleeding in the air. Yeah, but our ecchymosis can be... be um, described as bleeding in a specific area of the skin. So what I, what I want you to understand is that a ecchymosis and a hematoma is a contusion. Both of them are contusions. How do I know the difference? Yes, Mr. Cameron. Yes, sir. Be in here. So um, with a hematoma, sir, it would be um, bleeding and pooling of blood beneath the skin where it would appear to have a swelling circular effect at the site. And the ecchymosis is what? I'm not too keen for the ecchymosis. But I can give a part of the answer, yo. <laughs> Don't give me the full answer. All right, ecchymosis. Ecchymosis. Just feel that never Okay. All right, Mr. Manning, let me hear what you have to say. 
<laughs> All right, sir. So, um, go ahead, Miss Salani. Is it me? What what happened to what what? Oh, where's Mr. Manning? He had his. Go ahead. Sir, I think you muted me a while ago. Oh, um, oh. sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. So the the the, the um, where was I? Yeah, the ecchymosis part of it, sir. That would basically be um the result of the pooling of the blood, right? So it's basically like the 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 the, the changing of the color of the skin, basically. It shows that the pooling is occurring. And also cause the the color of the skin to change, right? So not quite dear. All right. Yes, Miss Cephas, go ahead. All right, sir. So um, hematoma is more like a blood clot. So it it's more like you're swelling there, and ecchymosis is more like. Um, skin discoloration but in this case we're talking about the eyes so it would be in the sclera all right uh, a hematoma is not a clot okay so a hematoma is not a, a clot a clot will either be referred to as an embolus or a, a thrombosis <clears throat> okay thank you sir so uh the difference is the blood vessel that is bleeding. That's the difference, right? So a uh, ecchymosis and a hematoma are both contusions. Ecchymosis is caused by bleeding from a small blood vessel. So you will just see a flat area for an ecchymosis. You don't see a lot of swelling when there is an ecchymosis, right? Because it's a small blood vessel. A, a hematoma is caused from a large blood vessel bleeding. So ecchymosis is usually associated with tiny blood vessels, capillaries, maybe arterioles or venules. The hematoma is going to be associated with larger blood vessels. So you're going to see the area produce swelling for a hematoma. And a hematoma Swelling is not a key finding, right? So a patient can have a hematoma in their abdomen. Anywhere in the body, you can get a hematoma. A lot of persons associate a, a hematoma with a cocoa. That's a, a common example of a hematoma, right? but it can occur anywhere inside of the body. It depends on the blood vessel that is bleeding. So that's that. All right, so ecchymosis bruising that develops under the eyes we call that raccoon eyes and ecchymosis that develop behind one ear we call that mastoid behind the one ear over the mastoid process that's battle signs so you can see discoloration around the eye and behind ears these are late findings associated with a skull fracture Now, a patient can have a linear skull fracture, which is the most common type of skull fractures. It accounts for about 80% of all skull fractures. It is not associated with visible deformity. So they may pick it up using radiograph, right? So it's not associated with, with um, physical deformity. Obvious deformity, I should say. <clears throat> So radiographs are required to diagnose a linear. Linear means line, it's moving in a, a line. Linear skull fracture because there are no physical signs. All right, next we have a depressed skull fracture. So this is when an area of the brain, sorry, of the skull is depressed downward into the brain tissue. This requires significant force. So it result, result from high energy, direct trauma to the head with a blunt object, 
frontal or parietal bones are most susceptible. Bone fragments may be driven into the brain tissue. Then you have your basilar skull fracture. This is associated with high energy trauma as well, usually occurs occur following diffuse impact to the head. Signs include CSF, so you're gonna see um, CSF draining out of the ears. This one is associated with battle signs and raccoon eyes. Again, these are not things that you will see developing quickly, things that develop late, right? Raccoon eyes, battle signs. <clears throat> then you have your open skull fractures. Results when severe force, forces are applied to the head, often associated with trauma to multiple body systems. Brain tissue may be exposed to the environment. All right, now traumatic brain injuries. This is the most serious compli complication from a head injury, traumatic brain injuries. So most serious, of all head injuries, two broad categories. You have primary, which is direct injury, and you have secondary, which is indirect injury. So primary brain injury results from in, instantaneously, sorry, results intense, instantaneously from impact to the head, and secondary is going to be the effects as a result of that direct injury. What are the signs and symptoms associated with that? That would be the, the secondary brain injury, hypoxia, paralysis, swelling, right? So secondary stuff would be like hypoxia, hypertension, swelling of the brain tissue, bleeding inside of the skull, um, insufficient flow to the cerebral blood vessel, infection. These are secondary issues. Right? And there's a slide that depicts that. So hypoxia, hypertension, cerebral edema, that swelling, intracranial hemorrhage, increased intracranial pressure, this is bad. So ICP going up inside of the skull is bad. Remember, the brain occupies majority of the space inside of the, the skull and cerebrospinal And blood vessel is at 10 percent so if fluid the fluid pressure starts to go up it can create significant pressure on the brain and the blood vessels and a patient with a head injury cannot have their cerebral perfusion pressure drop they need cerebral perfusion pressure in other words they cannot have a systolic pressure that's less than 110. The systolic should not be allowed to go below 90. They're going to be in trouble. They can, the secondary can be linked to cerebral ischemia, lack of oxygen. We know that term by now. <clears throat> now, the brain injury can be, sorry, the brain can be injured directly by penetrating object or indirectly as a result of a external forces and you can have an anterior portion of the brain being um, injured and a posterior portion of the brain being injured as well we call a coup contra coup i think that's french for occurring at two points or something like that it's a french word <clears throat> a coup coup contra coup injury can result from striking a windshield so the head hits the windshield, resulting in an anterior injury. And when the head goes back and hit the, the headrest, you get the posterior injury. So the brain is slammed into the, the inner anterior and posterior portions of the skull. That's cool, contra cool. All right, intracranial pressure. This is accumulation of blood within the skull or swelling of the brain. So, sorry, accumulation of blood within the skull or swelling of the brain can rapidly lead 
to an increase in ICP. And as I said previously, this is bad, very bad for your patient because the, how the body compensates for ICP makes it worse. How the body compensates for raised intracranial pressure actually makes the situation worse. So what is going to happen is if a patient has a head injury and there is bleeding or swelling inside of the brain, that swelling or bleeding will cause the ICP to rise, which creates pressure on the blood vessels. So the blood vessels that are supposed to supply the brain with blood are compressed and the body is going to feel like the brain is not getting enough blood. And what the body does to compensate for that is raise the blood pressure. So the body is going to increase the blood pressure inside of the body and then open up the, the blood vessels that supply the brain so that more blood can go to the area. And that's a recipe for disaster because if pressure is building up inside of the, the skull and the body raises the temperature and increases blood flow to that area, the pressure is going to get worse to the point that it can start to push the brain tissue from its normal anatomic position. So the brain can actually start to herniate. <clears throat> That's very bad because that pressure will severely affect cerebral perfusion pressure. That's the pressure needed to keep the brain cell perfuse. So it's not a good, a good um, compensating mechanism. Now, signs of increased intracranial pressure, you're going to see irregular breathing patterns or the breathing becomes very, very slow. You're gonna see a chain stokes respiration. Anybody remember what chain stokes respiration is? I'm not sure. Uh, yes, go ahead, Mr. Powell. Is that the respiration? Well, the respiration where you have um, an increase in breathing, then a decrease, then an increase, then it rises and fall again. Right. In terms so, of yes, it's an irregular breathing pattern, but it has consistency to its irregularity. So the breathing rate goes up, goes down, pause, goes up, goes down, pause. There's a, a distinct pattern to it. What's What's the difference between chain stokes and ataxic biot respirations? Anybody know the, the answer to that question? Ataxic respirations. How is that different from chain stokes? No takers? Okay. Ataxic biot respiration means it is irregular, irregular. So it's an abnormal breathing pattern associated with a brain injury or head injury that has no distinct pattern to its irregularity. You can't find a distinct pattern. It's irregular. Right? Speed up, no. Speed up, speed up. Slow down. Pause, pause. But there is no distinct pattern to that breathing. The patient can have decreased pulse rate, headache, nausea, vomiting, decreased alertness or level of alertness, bradycardia. Brady, look out for that bradycardia, right? The bradycardia might indicate neurogenic shock. So bradycardia is associated with neurogenic shock. Sluggish or non-reactive pupils, decerebrate posturing or decorticate posturing. We need to be familiar with these things. So decorticate, the hands come in towards the, the, the center core of the body and it has an abnormal um, position and the toes start, start to point outward. That's sign that the brain is starting to herniate. 
um, the cerebrate is when the the arms are are at the side, but they stiffen up at the side of the body, and the toes are pointing out. It's abnormal extension of the 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 um, extremities. Oh. Yes, that's possible, Mr. Johnson. That's possible. Um, then you have your cushion reflex. Now, with your cushion reflex, you're looking for three things. You're looking for an abnormal breathing pattern. It tend to be slow breathing. You are looking for a blood pressure going up and you're looking for a pulse rate slowing down. So it's, um, <clears throat> this, is, this is what we call cushion reflex. The, you're looking for an abnormal breathing pattern and it's usually gonna be slow, a slow breathing pattern. You're looking for the blood pressure to go up and you're looking for a bradycardic pulse. That's cushion reflex associated with raised intracranial. If you start to see cushion reflex, it means that the pressure inside of the skull, the intracranial pressure is rising. That's bad for head injury. All right, now intracranial hemorrhage can also cause ICP to go. Up. So bleeding inside the skull also increases ICP. Bleeding can occur between the skull and the tough layer of the membrane, that's the dura mater. It can occur beneath the dura mater, outside of the brain, and it can occur within the tissue of the brain itself. So let's look at bleeding outside the dura mater. So if you look at this diagram, you'll see where the bleeding is occurring outside of the dura mater that's referred to as epidural. It's above the dura. Epidural hematoma. So this is a hematoma. Notice there is no visible swelling on the outside. And that is what I was mentioning previously. So you can have a hematoma and there is no, no deformity noted because what classifies it as a Hematoma is a type of blood vessel that is bleeding. So if it's a large blood vessel, it is classified as a hematoma. If it's a small blood vessel, it is referred to as an ecchymosis. Now with hematoma, epidural hematoma, it's associated with blunt force trauma to the temple of the head and it's going to be the middle meningeal artery that's damaged. And what you find with this patient is the patient is gonna receive blunt force trauma to the head and loses consciousness. So they lose consciousness from that blow. And then they regain consciousness. But after they regain consciousness, their level of alertness and orientation starts to gradually decline until they go unresponsive again. That's an epidural hematoma. So as I said, the person gets hit to the temple at the head, they lose consciousness, regain it, regain consciousness, but their level of orientation starts to decline as the bleeding occur inside of the skull, above the, the dura, until they go unresponsive. That's an epidural hematoma. So it's the accumulation of blood in the skull and the dura mater, nearly always the result of a blow to the head that produces a linear fracture. My connection went down. Are you still able to hear me? My connection is dropping. All right. No, the... Epi is above, subdural means it's below, right? So, and that's why I said to you earlier, remember the, the three letters. So let me show you what I mean. 
because this is how I always picture it in my head that I don't forget. So you have B, then you have A, then you have P, right? Now let me enlarge this. So let's expand this. You have D, move that up here. Then you have A, put that right here. And then we have the P and I'll enlarge that a little and put that here. So these are the, the three layer, layers. You have the dura, arachnoid, and pia. So I always try and picture it like this in my head, dura, arachnoid, pia. If it's a epidural, so if it's epidural, this is where the bleeding is occurring, above the, the dura. That's epidural bleeding. If it is subdural, then it's going to be here below the, the dura. So subdural is below the, the dura. So it's accumulation of blood beneath the dura matter, but outside, it's still outside the brain, right? It occurs after a fall. Now this type of bleeding is, it is more associated with your geriatric population, right? So geriatric patient at home, maybe come out of the bathroom, the ground a little slip, slippery, lose their balance, hit their head, right? And they come out of the bathroom, they sit down, not having much issues, maybe a little bruise at the, the side of the head. And within a week or two weeks, the family member say, you know, so they, she fell about two weeks ago. And then um, after that, like a week or two, she started to be abnormal. Her, her, her actions just changed. She's not interacting much. And we reach a point now where we can't even get a response from her. That is a subdural hematoma. So they fall down. And then because it's not a large blood vessel, well, not necessarily a large blood vessel, but where the blood vessel is, it takes time for that bleeding to accumulate. It's not like the, the epidural, which is more arterial. Subdural tend to be more venous um, related. So it's gonna ble bleed a little slower. So it takes time to build. As it start to build up, it will get to the point where it start to affect the brain. That's where the level of consciousness start to change, right? That's where the level of consciousness start to change and it becomes a problem. <clears throat> now, intracerebral hematoma. This is bleeding inside the brain tissue itself. So this is literally inside of the brain itself. So ble bleeding within the brain itself can occur following a penetrating injury to the head or because of rapid deceleration forces. Then you have your subarachnoid hemorrhage. This bleeding occurs in the subarachnoid space. So the arachnoid is the middle layer. So you're gonna have bleeding occurring in that space because it's, there's more, um, it's called arachnoid because it had that spider network for the, the blood vessels. So you have some space there when the bleeding start to occur, it will run on the, the pia mater. So it's gonna run on the pia mater, which is directly over the brain tissue and it starts to irritate that, right? Starts to cause irritation of headache. Um, they can complain of feeling nauseous or want to vomit. Vomiting is a common sign with head injury. Common causes include trauma, rupture of an aneurysm. An aneurysm is a weak point in an artery. 
All right, now let's look at concussions. And they may have to change the literature on this. But anyway, a, a concussion is a blow to the head or face. It may cause concussion of, sorry, a blow to the head or face may cause concussion of the brain. It's a closed injury with temporary loss or alteration of part or all of the brain's ability to function without any physical signs of damage. Now, concussions, you will see patients that have concussions in motor vehicle accidents, falls, stuff like that. But you're going to see this more in the sports industry, contact sports, American ball, boxing. They tend to have concussion um, injuries. About 90% of patients do not experience a loss of con consciousness, right? Some can. But when they regain, they're going to have a problem with memory. So they don't remember what happened, what, either what um, transpired before or after they lost, um, after they, they lost consciousness. They can't remember anything before or after, either one or the other. Now, the literature currently states that a concussion is temporary. However, there is something that is referred to as a concussion syndrome. Right? No, concussion syndrome is not temporary and it is from repeated trauma to the brain and they're starting to discover this in a lot of the American football players in the United States. A lot of them, when they, after death, when they examine their brain, they're realizing that there's a lot of trauma to the brain and they were displaying changes in their behaviors. Right, so they, it can be subtle changes. It can be the person, somebody that was usually calm becomes very aggressive. They get sensitivity to light. They get frequent headaches. Um, they start to have problem with their speech, memory. A whole heap of things can happen with concussion syndrome. Right, so, but it is something that the U.S. has not tried to address because American football makes a lot of money in the United States, makes a lot of money, not for the players. Yes, the players are making millions, but there's a difference between someone being rich and somebody being wealthy, right? So when you're, when you're rich, um, yeah, you're making money, but there's a cap on that, meaning your riches can decline if you don't invest properly. When you're wealthy, you write the paycheck for the person that is rich. So it's not up, the, the players are making money, but after your, their contracts end, there is nothing in place to, to say, okay, how are we going to help these patients, these guys, if they start to have issues with their brain and stuff like that, right? So a lot of players are retiring with all type of complications with their brain because of the constant trauma that they had to endure playing football. So as I said, the, the literature will be updated, but it can be, concussion can be temporary or you can develop what is known as concussion syndrome. And it can be from multiple um, trauma, or it can be from one incident. Right? Cause there was a kickboxer that he wasn't even knocked out completely. He just took a, a very hard hit to the head and he was rocked, but he did not lose consciousness. And after that fight, he started to, to, to develop concussion syndrome, started to have severe pain, um, photosensitivity, mood swings, and he had to retire from the sport. He's now a commentator, right? So it can be from just, from just one impact or multiple. All right, so a patient with a concussion may be confused or have amnesia. Usually a concussion lasts only a short time. 
Now ask about these symptoms, dizziness, weakness, visual changes, nausea and vomiting, ringing in the ears, slurred speech, inability to focus. All of these are associated with concussion. Lack of coordination, delay of motor function, inappropriate emotional response, temporary headache, disorientation. So the same signs and symptoms that they get with the temporary concussion is the same symptoms that they get with concussion syndrome, which is long-term effects. The same effects. It's just now long-term. Once it's long-term, it's referred to as concussion syndrome. Big problem in the United States. Now, contusion, far more serious than a concussion because this is direct injury to the brain tissue itself. So it involves physical injury to the brain tissue, may sustain long-lasting and even permanent damage. A patient may exhibit any or all of the signs of a brain injury. Other brain injuries, Brain injuries can also arise from medical conditions, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be trauma-related, can be from a medical condition. And if it's a medical condition, it would be from a blood clot, either a thrombosis or an embolus, right? So it can be a thrombus clot or an embolus clot. When we get to medical emergencies, I'll explain the difference or it can be from a blood vessel that bursts inside of the, the head and causes severe hemorrhaging. The signs and symptoms will be the same. So whether it's a medical um, issue causing the brain injury, the brain complication or a trauma causing the brain complication, the signs and symptoms will be the same. But usually you want to think about a medical cause when there are no physical signs and symptoms that indicate that there was any type of trauma to the patient. All right, now spine injuries. Compression injuries can result from a fall. This is that compress the patient's vertebral body can cause herniation. So this can shift from its normal position that can cause complication with the spine. Motor vehicle crashes can overextend the spine. You can get rotation, flexion injuries of the spine, which results from rapid acceleration forces. <clears throat> when the spine is pulled along its length, you get hyperextension. That's when the head moves back. So extension would be when the head moves back. Hyperextension is when you exceed that range of motion. Any one of these unnatural motions as well as excessive lateral bending can result in fractures or neurologic deficit. When bones of the spine are altered from traumatic forces, they can fracture or move out of place. Now let's look at the patient assessment now. So, Always suspect a possible head or spinal injury. Don't suspect one without the other. So if you suspect spinal complications, suspect head, in, in, head injury. If you suspect head injury, suspect spinal complication. So suspect head or spine with motor vehicle collision. Pedestrian versus motor vehicle. Motor vehicle always win. Falls, blunt trauma. And remember, falls that are three times an adult's height is considered significant. Falls that are two and a half times a pediatric height is considered significant. If a patient falls from a standing position and loses consciousness, that is significant. Blunt force trauma, penetrating trauma to the head, neck, back, or torso. Rapid deceleration injuries, hangings, and hanging will cause distraction of the spine. So it's going to pull the, the spine up. Well, pull it in a straight line. That's distraction of the spine. Axial loading injuries, compression, diving accidents. 
All right, so your scene size up, scene safety. Evaluate every scene for hazards to your health and the health of your team or bystanders. Be prepared with appropriate standard precaution, including gloves and masks and eye protection. Request ALS if you're in that type of system. If not, you need to think about the most appropriate healthcare facility and how far you are away from that location. <clears throat> mechanism of injury or nature of illness. Mechanism will be specific to trauma. Nature of illness is more medical. Look for indicators of MOI. Consider how the MOI produced the injury. Injury is expected. Primary assessment. So after the scene size up, it's time to identify and manage immediate and potential life threats. So focus on identifying and managing life-threatening concerns, not vital signs. Focus on managing life threats. There is a difference. Threats to circulation, earway breathing, external hemorrhage. Reduction of unseen time and recognition of critical patient increases the patient's chances for survival or reduction in the amount of irreversible damage. Time is brain, time is heart. It's a trauma patient. You don't want to exceed 10 minutes on that scene with a critical trauma patient. Within six minutes, all life threats should be addressed. We need to move quickly with our trauma patient. If it's a critical trauma patient, it's surgical interventions that are, will be the best care that this patient can get. So the quicker we get them to the hospital, the better. What might be beneficial to the patient in a pre-hospital setting is the use of tourniquets, hemostatic dressing, IV fluid resuscitation that is administered in controlled circumstances. Because really, the patient would benefit more from blood products. But if you're going to give IV fluid, it needs to be controlled administration. <clears throat> Spinal motion restriction consideration. Assess the patient in the position phone. So you always try and communicate with that patient with the head in a neutral position. That's how we're gonna try and always approach them so that they don't look to the right, look to the left or look over, right? Yeah, try and approach them in the line of vision. Determine whether or not a cervical color needs to be applied. Assess the scene to determine the risk of injury from a general, general impression based on the level of consciousness and chief complaint. The bot board often places the patient in an anatomically incorrect position for a long period of time, right? So the truth is a bot board does not immobilize the spine. It can restrict motion, but it does not immobilize the spine. Same thing, C color does not immobilize the neck. It restricts motion of the neck. So if you're going to be using spine board, your protocols need to be clearly defined because spine boards can be linked to circulation issues. So it can cause problem with circulation in other skin. It can cause problem with your management of the patient's airway. It can cause complications in patients with penetrating trauma. The C color can cause intracranial pressure to go up. So there are complications associated with spine board application. Therefore, your protocols must be clearly defined. So the place that I was working with in Texas, they had protocols that we can use to either rule out spinal injury or rule in spinal injury. Right? And there are certain patients that we were not supposed to use spine boards for, right? Because that particular service, we were not allowed to use spine boards for patients with penetrating trauma. So as I said, your protocol must be clearly defined. And this is a discussion that you have to have with your medical directors. 
because the protocols and the evidence that's coming out now supports selective use of the spine board and C color. So it's very selective now. All right, now the cervical color, it helps to maintain spinal motion restriction. The best time to apply the cervical color depends on the patient's injuries. And what I will say to you is, at no point you should have a C color on your patient's neck and you have not assessed airway, breathing, and circulation. That is a no-no because the C color can affect your ability to manage the airway. So if I see you doing that in, a, in, a, in your lung case assessment, I will fail you. Once the cervical color is on, do not remove it unless it causes a problem with maintaining airway, right? So it can be that you put on a, a C color and then you're going to check a patient's airway. It must have been that you check airway breathing and circulation, manage the life threats there. You're getting ready now to package your patient. Now it makes sense to put on a, a C color at that point. All right. <clears throat> Assess for signs and symptoms of head or spine injury. Ask about the chief complaint, right? Is your patient confused? Is there slurred, slurred speech? Repetitive questioning? Is there signs of amnesia? Patient keep asking you what happened and, or the patient keep telling you I need to go home, I need to get to work, I'm gonna be late and not focusing on what is currently happening to them. That's a red flag. In the setting of trauma, assume your patient has a head injury until your assessment proves otherwise. If the patient is found unresponsive, emergency responders, family members, or bystanders may have helpful information. Unresponsive trauma patients should be assumed to have spinal injury. Patients with a decreased level of responsiveness should be considered to have spinal injury based on their chief complaint. Earway breathing and circulation considerations. Use a jaw trust maneuver to open the earway. If the jaw trust maneuver is ineffective, use the head tilt chin lift maneuver as a last resort. We know this by now. Vomiting may occur in a patient with a head injury. Vomiting is a common sign associated with head injury patients, right? Trauma head injury patients. Irregular breathing pattern may result from increased ICP. You need to be looking out for these things. Oxygen is always indicated for patients with head and spinal injuries. A pulse oximeter value should, should not be below 90%. So you don't want a pulse ox below 90% for a patient with head and spine injury. Hyperventilation should be reserved for specific conditions. So there is a protocol that will say if the patient is showing signs of ICP, raise ICP to hyperventilate the patient. You don't mean you're going to breathe um, fast. You're just slowing down the they, you're shortening the interval between your breaths. So if it was one breath every five to six seconds, you shorten it to one breath every three seconds. That's really what hyperventilation is. It's not just squeeze, 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 and that's how it work. That don't make no sense. You're just gonna put ear into the patient's stomach. A pulse that is too slow, in the thing of a head injury can indicate a serious condition. A single episode of hypoperfusion in a patient with a head injury can lead to significant brain damage and even death. Your brain cannot function with low cerebral perfusion pressure. That is bad. So if the blood pressure is low, it's bad. If the blood pressure is high, it's bad. Both is bad. Assess for signs and symptoms of shock, control bleeding. Manner of transport. Patients with impaired airway, open head wounds, 
where abnormal vital signs may need to be rapidly extra extricated from a motor vehicle and transported. Providing the patient with a patent airway and supplemental oxygen is paramount. Suction should be readily available, maintaining immobilization of the spine based on your protocol. So when it comes to spinal immobilization, you are going to be guided by your protocols. Yes, I'm going to teach you how to put, put on a C-color properly. Yes, I'm going to teach you how to put a patient on a spine board. I'll teach you all of the variations, right? So you can find the patient sitting, can find the patient supine, can find the patient in a prone position, can find the patient standing. You know, all of these variations you need to know to put the patient on a spine board. And I'll teach you how to do that. But when you go back to your various organizations, you are to be guided by protocols because what is coming out now is that the approach to spinal injury needs to be selective. So there must be criteria that are present and the patient must meet the criteria for us to use certain devices now. <clears throat> All right, now after the primary assessment phase, next is history taking, right? So we will obtain a medical history and be alert for injury specific signs and symptoms as well as pertinent negatives. Using OPQRST may provide some background on isolated extremity injuries that they're having pain or complain of pain. Four, gather as much sample history as you can while preparing for transport. In your secondary assessment, instruct the patient to keep still, not to move the head or neck. And usually, if the patient is responsive and cooperative and they're having pain in their neck, back, they will keep their neck in a, in a neutral position, right? So once they can, they are able to cooperate with you and you tell them, hey, don't, don't, don't move your head. If they're having any discomfort in their neck or back or in anywhere within the spine, they're not going to be moving a lot. <clears throat> now, physical examination. Maybe a systematic head-to-toe full body scan or a systematic assessment that focuses on certain area or region of the body. Vital sign, significant head injuries may cause the pulse to slow and the blood pressure to rise. And if you can link that to an irregular breathing pattern, your patient has Cushing reflex or Cushing triad. Cushing's triad, that means that the patient has ICP that's rising or the brain is starting to herniate. With neurogenic shock, the blood pressure may drop and the heart rate may increase to compensate. Now, respirations will become erratic. Use your monitor, monitoring device. <clears throat> Perform a full body scan using DCAP BTLS. Examine the head, chest, abdomen, extremities, and back. Check perfusion, monitor function, and sensation in all extremities prior to moving the patient. A decreased level of consciousness is the most reliable sign of a head injury. Look for leaking, blood, or CSF. Assess pupil size and reaction. And if you're seeing unequal pupils, that's a red flag that there might be some pressure building up inside of the brain. Do not probe open scalp laceration with your glove finger. Neurologic examination. Perform baseline assessment using Glasgow Coma Scale, GCS. Always use simple, easily understood terms when reporting the level of consciousness. Record level of consciousness that fluctuates or deteriorates. So this chart here, wherever it is in your textbook, it's time for you to learn it. How to 
evaluate a patient's Glasgow coma scale. So it looks at eye opening, best verbal response, and best motor response. The most the patient can get for eye opening is four. The most the patient can get for verbal is five. The most the patient can get for motor is six. So a good score would be 15. A score of three to 15 may indicate mild dysfunction, although 15 is the score a person with no neurologic disabilities would receive. A score of nine to 12 may indicate moderate. Anything below nine, your patient will require aggressive airway management. So your best airway management skill, if the patient has a GCS below nine, they will need that or higher. Right, so they will need good skill or above that level of skill, meaning advanced airway management. Spine examination. Inspect for decap BTLS and check the extremities for perfusion, motor, and sensory. So you're checking circulation, which is the pulse, motor, and sensory. All we're doing is checking to see if the pulse is present. So it's not checking pulse, skin condition, temperature, hydration, and cap refill. When we check PMS, pulse, motor, and sensory, we're checking neurovascular function, not circulation. If there is impairment, note the level. Pain or tenderness when you palpate the spinal area is a warning sign. Other signs and symptoms include deformity, numbness, weakness, or tingling in the extremities and soft tissue injuries. Reassessment. Repeat your primary reassessment and chief complaint, recheck intervention. These injuries can suddenly affect the respiratory, circulatory, and nervous system. Reassess at least every 15 minutes. So you're looking at the int interventions. Are they working? Or is the patient vital signs progressing? Is it, going, it is, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Is there anything you need to change? What is the patient's level of consciousness? Is it improving? Is it getting worse? You must act quickly to evaluate and treat these patients. If CSF is present, cover the wound with sterile gauze, but do not bandage tightly. Administer high flow oxygen and apply cervical color. Right, so when you're bandaging the head, we do not want to bandage tightly, right? We don't want to bandage tightly. We have to leave room for, for swelling to occur. Um, don't be too, too caught up on controlling CSF coming out of the, the ears. Or they need to let that run. Because if you start to let that accumulate inside of the skull, it's going to add to the pressure that's building up. What you can do is catch it on a gauze and examine it. Halo with a red That's definitely CSF. That's not blood alone. My signal is down again. I hope you can hear me. Communication and documentation would come in your reassessment. Your documentation should include the history you obtain at the scene, your findings during your assessment, treatments you provided, how the patient respond, responded to them. And you have three formats for documentation. You have the chart method, the SOAP method, and chronological order. But generally, your report should, should have in it what the patient um, complained of, what was your observation, what did you do based on your observation, how the patient responded to your intervention and your method of transportation. 
All right, now let's look at emergency medical care, head injury. Three general principles. Establish an adequate airway. Got to have an airway. Control bleeding and provide adequate circulation to maintain cerebral perfusion. Begin CPR if necessary. Follow standard precautions. Assess the patient's baseline level of consciousness and you need to continually monitor the patient's level of consciousness. Very important in head injury patients. Managing the airway. The most important step is establishing an adequate airway. Perform jaw thrust maneuver. Once the airway is open, maintain the head and cervical spine in a neutral, inline position until you have placed a cervical collar and have secured the patient on a backboard. Generally, NPAs are contraindicated for patients with significant trauma. So that's a no-no. Most protocols will not allow you to insert an NPA, nasopharyngeal airway, in a patient with severe traumatic injuries, especially head or spine. All right, so that's, this would be maintaining neutral alignment of the spine. So somebody has to maintain the head in neutral alignment. The other person performs the assessment. And you, if you have somebody else, they can be doing other interventions because the truth is two persons should not be managing a critical head injury patient. I would say you need at least four persons for that type of patient. So ideally, it's four persons you want. Two persons cannot. Well, it is possible, but you will not get the best results with two persons. Right? You're going to need some assistance. Managing the airway. Remove any foreign body secretions or vomitus. Make sure a suction unit is available. Check ventilation. Give supplemental oxygen to any patient with suspected head injury. Circulation. Begin CPR if the patient is in cardiac arrest. Active blood loss will aggravate hypoxia, so we need to address that. You can almost always control bleeding from a scalp laceration by applying direct pressure over the wound. Shock is usually the result of hypovolemia. Indicates that the situation is critical. Transport immediately to a trauma center. And as I say, if your protocol allows, Fluid resuscitation will be beneficial, but it has to be done in a controlled manner. If it's not controlled, if you're just flinging up fluids and run fluids inside of the patient, you're going to dilute clotting factors. You're gonna dilute all of the patient clotting factors, and you're gonna alter the pH of the blood if you end up doing that. That's not good for a patient with a head injury. Cushing's triad, increase blood pressure, that's hypertension, decrease heart rate, bradycardia, irregular respiration, chain strokes or bias respiration. Perform controlled hyperventilation of your patient via positive pressure ventilation. And this is, will be based on your protocol. So if your protocol don't allow it, you shouldn't be doing it. And as I said, all you're doing is shortening the intervals for your ventilation. You're not just squeezing, random, randomly squeezing the bag. You're still bagging the patient, but it's gonna be at a shorter interval. 20 breaths per minute is ideal. So what the hyperventilation does is it will cause the cerebrospinal, sorry, the cerebral arteries that supply the brain to vasoconstrict, so when there is excess oxygen in your cerebral artery, it starts to vasoconstrict. The same thing happens with the coronary artery. So it's gonna vasoconstrict and less blood will go to the brain, which is what you want in a patient with raised intracranial pressure. You want less blood going to the, the brain. <clears throat> 
right? But as I say, must be guided by your protocols and medical direction. Why? Because if it's not done properly, and we cause less blood to go to the brain, and it's not in a controlled manner, you can cause the cerebral perfusion. And that also is not good for the patient with a head injury. So it has to be guided by medical direction. Right? And really what this patient needs is intubation. That's what a head injury patient requires. They need to be intubated. Right? But you'll be guided by your protocols. All right, now emergency medical care of spinal injury. Follow your standard precautions. Maintain the patient's airway while keeping the spine in a proper position. Assess respiration. Give supplemental oxygen. Manage form a jaw truss. After you open the airway, consider an oral pharyngeal airway if it is indicated. No nasopharyngeals, even if it's indicated. Have suction unit available. Give supplemental oxygen if it is required. <clears throat> right? We know to, this is the jaw truss maneuver. So all we're doing is manipulating the mandible without causing any shifting of the neck. <clears throat> Immobilize the head and trunk so that the bone fragments do not cause further damage. However, cervical spine motion restriction cannot come before ABCs. You must address life threats first. Never force the head into a neutral inline position. Key in information so you don't go against resistance. So if the patient head turned to the side and when you try to put it in neutral position, there is resistance or severe pain, leave it as it is. Immobilize a patient in his or her current position. <clears throat> Cervical colors. Provide pre preliminary partial support should be applied to every patient who has a possible spinal injury. To be effective, a rigid cervical color must be the correct size. So you have to size it properly and that will restrict motion in the cervical spine. So, cervic so spinal motion restriction consists of putting a, a cervical collar on your patient and placing the patient on a spine board and fully immobilize the patient. The cervical collar should rest on the shoulder girdle and provide firm support on the both sides of the mandible without obstructing the airway or ventilation. Once the patient's head and neck have been manually stabilized, assess pulse, motor, function, and sensation in all extremities. Then assess the cervical spine area and neck. For a supine patient, secure to a long, long backboard or vacuum mattress, but vacuum mattress preferred for geriatrics. Another procedure to move the patient from the room to a backboard is a four-person log room, which is the most commonly used method. You may also slide the patient onto a backboard using a vacuum mattress, if you have a vacuum mattress available. Vacuum mattress, an alternative to longboard is a vacuum mattress. It molds to specific contours of the patient's body, excellent for elderly or patient with abnormal curvature of the spine, can be used on a supine sitting or standing patient. So it's pretty useful. For your sitting patients, use a short backboard to restrict movement of the cervical and thoracic spine, then secure the short board to a long board. So you're going to use a kid or a short board. Exceptions include situations which you are, you are the patient is in danger, you need immediate access to other patients or the patient's injuries justify rapid extrication. For your standing patients, we will talk about that in, in um, practical because 
the new way of doing it is different from the old way. So I'm not gonna go into that right now. The spinal immobilization devices assume the, pre the presence of spinal injury in all patients who have sustained head injury. Use manual inline stabilization or a cervical collar and a longboard. You will be guided by your protocols. This is your kid. This is for your patient in a sitting position. Can also be used to stabilize a fractured pelvis and a fractured femur. Kendrick extrication device. This is your spine board. You need at least four persons to use this device effectively. The preferred spine board is the scoop spine board. So if you're gonna invest, if your company is going to invest in a spine board no, the school bot board would be the ideal choice. Helmet removal. For your helmet removal, the rationale for removing helmet will be based on your ability to manage the patient's airway and breathing issues. So if the helmet is firmly in place, and the patient's breathing is not compromised, then you leave the helmet on. It can act as a head immobilizer. If the helmet is too loose, it can't stay on. If the helmet is on and it, uh, it is affecting your ability to manage the airway, then it has to be removed. Now, for the chest, I didn't mention lecture. If there is an impaled object in the chest, the only time you will consider removing that object if, is if it is in a position that will affect your ability to provide chest compression for that patient. So if the impaled object is in an area in the chest where you need to put the palms of your hands to do chest compression, it has to be removed. Right. All right. And there are various methods. You can read this when you're going through the chapter. We'll do it in in um, the face-to-face -face session. Right. So that's a last point. The management in head and spine is largely linked to skills. Right. Your ability to put on a C color, put a patient on a spine board. It's largely related to your airway skills and your ability to um, restrict motion of the spine. Helmet removal will be based on your ability to manage the airway. <clears throat> and that brings us to the end of head and spinal injuries. Are there any questions? We have about 13 minutes. Any questions? All right, I don't, don't hear anybody. So again, I cannot overemphasize this. When you go out there to perform spinal motion restriction, you're, you're, you must have protocols that clearly define what it is you are expected to do. And how is it that you will rule in and rule out the possibility of spinal injuries because the protocols that now exist in first world response system or best practice response system are very effective right so there are some patients that may have spinal complications well i wouldn't say may have but are at risk for spinal complication, but the fact that the patient is able to, co co to communicate and follow commands and obey your instructions, they might not need a C color. You might not need to put them on a spine board. So as I say, it's a discussion that needs to, to be had, right? If you don't have clear protocols, you need to have a, a talk with your medical director or supervisor. 
because that's the direction that EMS is going. It's selective here. In other words, we are not going to be providing treatment if it's not needed. We're not going to be curing the patient on a spine board if it is not necessary. We're not going to be putting on a C colon a patient if it is not necessary. That's the direction we're going now, where EMS is concerned. <clears throat> so if there are no questions, then it is lunchtime. So we will resume at 1 p.m. This is my class. Yes, I am. And I just want to let the students know that, um, hold on one second. Just a moment, please. Um, I just want the students to know that I have been in touch with MITS. They have assured me that the situation will be resolved today and that they will be getting an email with the necessary instructions. I'm asking you guys, please, if by the end of the day you have not received that email, please send me an email so that I am aware. Okay? Okay. All right, thank you. All right, it is lunchtime. We will continue at 1 p.m. 